so this is our concluding panel for the day, which we have um, boldly labeled the solutions panel. Um, no pressure, guys. Um, but we have um, five uh, extraordinary individuals who come from a very diverse set of perspectives uh, to um, share what they've been doing to try and address drug pricing and high, dr high drug pricing. And I'm going to, um, I think I'm actually going to do the biographies one at a time and introduce each of you just to make a, you know, make a couple of minutes worth of remarks and then we'll try and pull off one of those fireside conversations. So first out of the gate is uh, Lauren Aronson. She's a principal at the government affairs firm uh, Melman, Castanetti, Rosen, and Thomas here in Washington. And she also serves as the executive director of the Campaign for Sustainable Pricing, Sustainable Drug Pricing, um, a broad-based broad coalition that promotes bipartisan market-based solutions to lower drug prices in America. Lauren's held several senior positions um, in the executive branch and the ledge branch, in, including the Office of Legislation at uh, CMS, House Ways and Means Committee, and the Office of Health Reform under President Obama. And so I'm going to give you five minutes. It's a good thing I'm a fast talker. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mary, and thank you, everyone, uh, for allowing me to speak here today on this important topic. It's been, I think, a wonderful conversation so far, and one that's been, at least for me, as I think about these issues all the time, it's been really helpful, actually, to take a step back and hear all of these very diverse perspectives. So thank you, everyone, for putting this together. Um, so our campaign is made up of a broad, diverse group of stakeholders. We represent consumers and health plans and hospitals and physicians and nurses and PBMs, and so basically everyone in, in the health care world, the exception of the pharmaceutical industry. And what unites our members is the concern about drug pricing. And so the way we sort of think about these issues is in three buckets. So one, we have, you know, the launch prices of new drugs coming to market, which is of great concern. Two, we have drugs that have been on the market for quite some time, who are, we've got the bad actors, the Martin Screllys of the world. Um, and then three, you know, we have the more incremental increases we're seeing from what I consider more of the mainstream companies like Pfizer and Novartis and Eli Lilly. And those increases are incremental, but they're significant. And they're happening multiple times a year. Um, Novartis is a great example where, you know, they had, I think, 116 different increases in the first three months of this year, ranging from 3% to 9%. So when you compound those and you think about it from a consumer or a payer perspective, that's just unsustainable. So in our mind, there are three different buckets. Um, and I think one of the things that we all struggle with here is what is the best policy solution to address this issue? So in my day-to-day -day life, you know, I deal with members of Congress um, all day long, and members want one issue, and they want one problem, and they want one solution. And I think the challenge here, as we've all discussed all day, is that there is no one solution to this problem. So in my mind, we need to kind of take a step back and think about, you know, we have the supply chain issues, but it also really originates with the manufacturer. And everything starts with the manufacturer and how they determine the price of a product. So we can have a conversation all day long about, you know, plans and, and, and PBMs, but again, it still, in my mind, comes back to how a price is initially set, and that's the list price, and everything flows from there. So as we're thinking about these issues, I think it's really critically important to consider how a manufacturer determines the price of a product and why everything kind of flows down from there. When I think about kind of the policy problems we need to address, many have been discussed today. We think about the issues with, um, you know, REMS abuses. We've had a fair amount of conversation about the CREATES Act. You know, I've been in Washington for 20 years, and the fact that you have Senator Feinstein and Ted Cruz and Rand Paul and Senator Pat Leahy all agreeing on an issue is pretty incredible. And also thinking about Norm Morenstein and his previous comments, you know, I worked for Rahm Emanuel in the House a long time ago, and so, you know, his job was to unseat Republicans, but yeah, we could get things done. And so I think the fact that you have, you know, a bipartisan group of senators, granted it's on one specific issue, but, you know, taking, it's, we got a chip at the block here. And so as we're trying to take on an issue, we need to address one by one. And so in my mind, the CREATES Act is just a really great example of how we're taking an abuse that the industry is undertaking right now by blocking generic competition. You have bipartisan support from a broad array of members. I think Dora also noted that Mark Meadows also supports the bill. So, I mean, it's rare that you have this level of bipartisan 
bipartisan support. And you also have stakeholders ranging from Freedom Works to Families USA and Public Citizen who support the bill as well, including our organization. So when I think about how do we effectuate change, we have to pick off one issue at a time and try to push on that issue. Um, so I think you know getting the Creates Act done this year would be something that would be fantastic. It also has federal savings. Um, and again, it, we would need to figure out how do we start to take off these issues and go off one by one. When I think about other solutions we need to address, obviously having a thriving biosimilar market is something that's incredibly important. You know, when we create the biosimilar pathway in the Affordable Care Act, I think a lot of us had hoped by this point, now that we're in 2018, we would have many more biosimilars on the market. But unfortunately, you know, we have uh, only three or four at, the, at this point that are actually on the market. So we need to take a step back and figure out, okay, what's going on here? Why don't we have a more thriving market? And in my mind, it comes back to the fact that we have some of these abuses that are taking place um, on, the, on the industry of the, the brand side where they're going into all these abusive practices and trying to prohibit biosimilar and generic competition. So, you know, thinking about patent estates is one that we have a lot of conversation about this morning. Um, particular, Humera is the one that infuriates me the most, where we have the AbbVie CEO specifically talked about patent estates as one of, you know, his strategies for protecting, you know, that drug. Um, Medicare Part D spent $1.5 billion on Humera alone in 2015. I mean, that is astounding. Um, Humira came to market in 2002. We should have had a generic or biosimilar on the market in 2016. We're now facing maybe 2036 uh, for a potential biosimilar. I mean, there was news last night that we're really lucky now that there's a patent settlement and now maybe one will come to market in 2023, but that is still infuriating considering that you know, the drug should have come off market in 2012. And I'm getting the note to wrap up. And I talk really fast, so <laughs> we, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, I think there are a couple other solutions we should just highlight real quick that we need to talk about what you're dealing with, things like product hopping and evergreening. Um, but in my mind, when I think about what's doable, we need to be very cognizant of politics. So having bipartisan support for bills is just incredibly important in this dynamic, which Norm sort of highlighted. But then, too, really trying to pick off issue one by one um, and thinking about where we can effectuate change change, short-term and long-term. Great. Thank you. Um, our next panelist is Representative Andrea Salinas. She's a member of the House, Oregon House of Representatives, um, a post she's held since September of 2017. She serves on the House Committees on Health Care, Transportation, and Ag and Natural Resources, and chairs the House Health Care Committee's Universal Access to Care Workgroup. <coughs> Representative Salinas was instrumental in passing House Bill 4005 in February of this year, which will bring transparency to pharmaceutical drug prices in the state. And um, maybe not coincidentally, prior to her service in the state legislature, um, Representative Salinas led a multi-stakeholder coalition called Oregonians for Affordable Drug Prices Now, which actually worked to change the political discourse about profits in the pharmaceutical industry. So we share some of your experience with that bill. Yes. Uh, thank you, and thank you for um allowing me to be here today. I feel so humbled with the expertise and knowledge in this room, and I've been learning a lot today. Um, so my name is Andrea Salinas. I'm from the Portland area of Oregon, and I came into this issue of drug pricing a couple of years back when I was a lobbyist for SEIU. And the Kaiser um, government affairs director came to me and said, what do you think, um, how would SEIU feel about trying to tackle drug prices? And for the previous I don't know, three to four years, we'd really been looking at hospital cost drivers, um, the union had. And so I said, I don't know, well, you know, let's, let's ask them and see what they think. And so I thought it was a great idea because I knew that um, drug prices back in 2015 were really starting to get out of control and they were starting to outpace hospital as a cost driver in plans and especially for public employees. So um, SEIU wasn't super interested. They didn't really think it was their fight to take on. So they said, well, we'll, you know, we'll see. We'll take a, a back seat. At the same time, the um, insurance companies in the state of Oregon had been experiencing um, playing a lot of defense on um, cap the copay bills, on different um, kinds of PBM bills, and those sorts of things. So they were really starting to become more invested in this topic. Then a, um, the vice chair, a new vice chair, he was a freshman member um, of the health care committee, was tasked with bringing stakeholders together. So PBMs, insurance companies, hospitals, um, and obviously pharmaceutical companies to figure out this prescription drug issue. So out of the 2015 session, he had about 18 months, so a year and a half, to come back with something in the 2017 session. Presumably something that was bipartisan. 
Um, we did not accomplish this. I was still working for SEIU as a lobbyist at the time, um, kind of monitoring and just um, backseat, even though it, it's, you know, the largest union in Oregon, probably some would say the most powerful union in Oregon, but they were still taking a back seat. At that same time, and this is why timing on all of this is so important, the pharmaceutical costs per unit really started to outpace hospital costs. In addition, um, utilization also was outpacing hospital costs. And Oregon, under its uh, Medicaid waiver, is under uh, a global capitation rate. So for the public employee unions, they, their health plan is also under a 3.4% medic, um, uh, medical growth rate. So they have to stay under that. And they realize suddenly, we're not going to be able to meet that charge, and our union members are going to lose out if we don't do something about drug pricing. So finally, for the 2017 session, all the stars were aligned. I was able to bring together some... Um, very powerful insurance companies, along with some very powerful unions, including the Nurses Association, the Oregon Education Association, um, and some public employees. With that, we were also able to um, bring in some coalition members and work, because we did have so many unions, in kind of a multi-state effort. So we were working with Nevada and California, who were also trying to pass a bill in 2017, to just find out kind of what some of the stronger policies might be, what some of the campaign pitfalls might be, and that sort of thing. So we really got a lot of pushback, obviously, from um, the pharmaceutical industry, um, who really just tried to deflect a lot. And I think it was one of our earlier speakers who said that, you know, he was pretty surprised that uh, legislators really didn't know about all of the public um, assets and all the taxpayer funding that goes into bringing a drug to market. And I found that to be very true. I've been working in politics and um, healthcare policy since... 97. Um, so it wasn't a surprise to me, but when I would explain this to, um, to different legislators, they were very surprised by this. And so there was a lot of education and a lot of um, just, you know, making sure that everybody was up to speed and on the same page. And to do that in a multi-state effort was also extremely helpful. Um, so we did bring a bill in 2017, and it was um, what some called a price-fixing bill. It uh, compared Oregon prices to the top five um, organization for Economic and Cooperative Development, so the top five OECD countries and what they paid, and then if those, um, if what Oregon was um, being charged was more than what those countries were paying for drugs, then the manufacturer would have to refund the payer. But the payer was also obligated to pass that refund on to consumers. That was also in the bill. So we thought we had all our bases covered. I knew I had all my votes in the House, but the Senate is very firm on trying to bring any controversial bills forward that are completely bipartisan. So that I know it sounds like an oxymoron. How can it be controversial and bipartisan? <laughs> so um, that bill ultimately failed, and we brought back a transparency bill this last session. So in 2018, um, we realized, okay, we have to take baby steps. And um, we were also able to, again, just continue our education process. We found a senator from a very rural area of Oregon, um, very conservative. It was um, my two, the two sponsors. And, and in that interim, I also was appointed to the seat I'm currently holding. Um, but the two chief sponsors of the bill, as different as night and day. Um, but he had experience with um, juvenile diabetes. He and his son both... Um, our patients, and they've experienced the skyrocketing increases in insulin. And so he had firsthand knowledge, both as a legislator, kind of what was going on with the pharmaceutical industry, as well as his own personal experience. And that really helped. It helped for him to educate his colleagues, as well as um, just to be a sponsor and a champion for this bill. In addition, the coalition that we had formed with the insurance companies and uh, the unions, as well as some other consumer groups, very, very similar to the Campaign for Sust Sustainable um, Prescription Pricing. In fact, we model a lot of our steps on that campaign. Um, we were able to figure out how to um, kind of what just all the necessary campaign steps. And as everyone has said, drug pricing is a populist, um, and bringing down those prices is a really populist idea. So we did some initial uh, polling on this and statewide, and we oversampled in obviously swing states, and even in those swing states, 
yes, everybody wanted lower prescription drug prices and they wanted somebody to do, somebody in government to do something about it. So that was kind of our, our drumbeat for the last two years. And finally, by this session, we were able to pass the bill that essentially requires that any drug that um, is $100 or more for treatment um, that increases 10% on a net basis annually will be required to show why the drug increased that much to our Department of Consumer and Business Services. And then, um, so pharma is um, still very upset about it. They just emailed me yesterday and said, we told you this bill isn't needed. And I was like, wow, you're, we passed it. Like, why are you still bothering me? Um, but they are. And so, so I think as we go into rulemaking, it'll be very important that we are very careful in the, uh, the actual implementation of the bill. Um, but I do think this is a very good step to kind of bringing that transparency, shedding a light on why drugs do cost as much as they do, um, you know, and we're asking for the starting price, um, and then figure out all of the rest of the pushback that we got. Okay, so what, what are, are PBMs responsible for? What are insurance companies responsible for? Patients, pres um, prescribers, physicians. Um, but we are very firm that this is our first step, and it's a good first step, and then we will be able to inform the legislature on what next steps we should take. And I'm so happy to know that in the bill, they also put kind of a next step task force in there. So we'll be looking at next steps right away and um, engaging with that task force. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next panelist, Jane Horvath, is a senior policy fellow at the National Academy of State Health Policy. Um, and there she leads the Emerging Issues team, um, leading work to foster state initiatives on drug prices. And I won't list all the reports you guys have put out recently, but nashp.org, and you can find a lot of interesting work. Um, prior to the Academy, Jane worked in the private sector as a consultant to life sciences foundations, advocacy organizations. She's held research positions at Johns Hopkins and MACPAC, the Medicaid Payment Advisory Commission, and spent 10 years at Merck working on coverage and reimbursement policies. Yes, yes. <laughs> full spectrum. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today. I've, um, my head is just spinning with all the things that um, we really need to discuss that have been discussed in, um, for this panel. Uh, I, I right now work specifically with states on drug pricing policy work. Our work is funded by the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. Um, so I, as a predicate to what states can do, I think it's important to talk about and understand how states are really hobbled in this space of trying to address prescription drug pricing and prescription drug costs. Um, we talked about, it was earlier mentioned about the Medicaid, pres uh, Medicaid prescription drug rebate program and the Medicaid best price. Uh, that has an effect in Medicaid, but it also has an effect on commercial payers and other government payers in, in a state. Uh, it limits sort of the level of discounting that can occur. Uh, and we also have a bunch of case law around federal patent law. Um, and it's really bad case law. There's not much of it, but it is pretty much on point, um, and it has yet to be sort of reconsidered anywhere. But it's a decision um, going back to, I think, 04, that basically had the District of Columbia with a price control law, manufacturer price control law, and they determined that it was a violation of the federal patent law. Um, and so it's really hard for a state to do the obvious thing of trying to control prescription drug prices because of that case law. And then we have a bunch of case law around the dorm dormant commerce clause, uh, which is also a hobble to states. Um, states have a hard time doing any sort of reference pricing outside of their state. Um, and then there's trade secrets law and FDA communications policies, which were referenced earlier when, when Mark was up here. So that, that's a whole constellation of problems or um, hurdles to be overcome. And so if you ever wonder why state policy around prescription drug pricing looks so insane um, and just crazy, it's because of trying to avoid all of these things. And some of the laws that we have right now on the books, um, Nevada is being challenged on the basis of um, many of these things. California is being challenged. Maryland is being challenged on one or more of these things, which is not to say how successful the industry is going to be or not, uh, but the industry is throwing everything at, and I'm, I've 
I have the clock ticking on, on how long it's going to take for Oregon to get sued uh, by the industry. But, uh, you know, a, a state that wants to try to avoid going to court, regardless of the, the, the merits of the state's position, uh, these are things that all have to be considered. Um, and, uh, you know, we can talk about it more later on, but two of the things that Nashby is promoting with states in terms of model acts that we have out there, and we're thinking of some other model acts too for states, but um, right now I, th I think two of the policies that states could consider that avoid a lot of these challenges um, would be uh, importation, Canadian importation, wholesale importation administered by the state. Um, and there is a very narrow window in federal statute that would permit this, provided a state could assure uh, significant savings at a consumer level and um, um, safety at putting um, consumers at no more risk than the current U.S. system. And, and I would note um, that there is federal authority for this to happen. It's never been executed on. Um, but also, people need to also understand that we have a global um, supply chain now that's been it's a big change in the industry over the last, I would say, 12 years. Um, and fully 40% of the products that we consume here in the United States were imported. Uh, they were manufactured elsewhere in the world. And fully 80% of the active pharmaceutical ingredients that go into U.S. manufacturing for U.S. products uh, comes from overseas, from places like China and elsewhere. So, you know, we already, the, the systems already exist to do importation safely. Uh, it's, it's a known quantity. And to have a state in charge of it as opposed to sort of a free-for-all commercial operation, um, we, we think very strongly that this could, is a viable approach as a, a tactic for an individual state. And then the other approach that we um, are promoting with states, and there's a couple bills out there now, Maryland is the furthest along, is um, rate setting, sort of setting up an all-payer rate setting system. And the important thing about both of these approaches um, address what other panels have talked about. Uh, number one, the sort of the profit taking throughout the system, the supply chain and the payment system um, on the price of drugs. Everybody does have somewhat of an incentive um, or less of an objection to higher and higher price drugs because of the rebates and other discounts um, that they get on these products. So you need to address that. And you also need to be able to see that the consumer can see the savings at the point of service. And both of these, the importation and the all-payer rate setting, would, would effectively do those things. It would, um, either approach has the effect of limiting what insurers will pay um, pharmacies, what pharmacies can charge, how wholesalers operate in a state. It, it just sort of pushes the competition back through the supply channel to the wholesaler and the manufacturer. But um, we can talk more about those things um, later on. But both of those approaches um, have been uh, analyzed by patent law experts, commerce law experts, and the, maternity, the Maryland Attorney General's Office as being able to be quite defensible in the, fa in the face of any sort of legal challenge on dormant commerce clause or patent law. Thank you, Jean. Um, next is Amy Gutierrez, um, Vice President and Chief Pharmacy Officer for Kaiser Permanente. Um, in her role there, here, she provides leadership and direction for the organization's $9 billion uh, clinical and pharmacy operations working to improve outcomes, member experience, affordability, standardization, and above all, regulatory compliance. Yes. <laughs> um, prior to coming to KP, Amy uh, was with the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. Um, lastly, there among her roles were Chief Pharmacy Officer for the Department and Hospital Pharmacy Director for Los Angeles County LAC uh, USC Medical Center. So, Amy. Thank you. And I'm in a unique position. I'm, I'm very honored to be amongst all the experts in this room. Um, I represent the pharmacists, the ones that are the gatekeepers. And just like the providers, my colleagues that spoke earlier, we're the ones at the front line that have to tell the patients and we have that prescription in our hand and when they can't make the copay we've got to put it back into stock so we're the ones that are the face to those patients. And it's very, very difficult to have to manage that, especially when you know that there's a medication that they can actually use. Um, I came up by um, working with, uh, with the uninsured and at my role in LA County. 
I uh, dealt with this in, in, in a big way just because we had so many uninsured patients that actually had to access drugs and it was really difficult to try to get them um, access to these high cost drugs. I remember um, a situation we had 10 years ago when we actually took on Merck Pharmaceuticals who had issued Gardasil vaccine and they would not allow um, patients that were not seen in a private office to get patient assistance program to prevent cervical cancer. So we, people said, well, you can't take on a pharmaceutical company. I go, yeah, we can. So we sent a letter to the Merck CEO, and we said, we're not going to use this. If you don't provide and open up access to uninsured patients to access, they get cervical cancer too. We need to have access. So we were able to actually change not only the policy for L.A. County, but also for the rest of the country, because they did open up patient assistance for uninsured. So there's a lot of things in terms of solutions that I see just from uh, my role. And part of it is there's been a lot of consolidation in the marketplace. We have, um, if you look at the, the whole um, PBM market, we've got three um, PBMs that are basically managing 80% of the market. And if you look at the Medicare, that's 90%. That's a big monopoly that's been created. Um, prescription drugs are the single largest health expenditure for patients, and they're really struggling with it. We are really looking at uh, pharmaceutical costs for specialty. It's projected that by 2020, 40% of our drug costs are going to be specialty. So that is going to be where all the brand name drugs, this is where the, this is going to, the rubber is going to meet the road with those high cost drugs. Um, we, uh, in terms of things that we can do, I'm going to focus more on the FDA and some of the price transparencies. I think we need to look at incentivizing generic competition. Uh, the FDA, if there's only one drug that's on the market on the generic side, why not create incentives for the number two, the number three, the number four, so that we can have a lot more generic competition. And then expedite review for those drugs. There's no reason to have the delays and the red tape that's in place right now for generics. And also have the FDA monitor the markets to identify monopolies and then proactively get involved um, and uh, look at ways of how the market's performing, any competitive manners, any concentrated um, or sole source markets, and take an active role in looking at that and providing information and taking actions. Also, um, one of the big things we deal with, at least in formulary, and I know my colleague Maisha there and I deal with it and Samir on our P&T committees, is the lack of comparative effectiveness information. A lot of times when drugs are released, there is no head-to-head -head studies. You're just comparing against placebo. So how do you know that that is the most effective drug without those head-to-head -head studies? If the FDA were to require some comparative effectiveness studies right at the market approval stage, that would be a big help for us. When you look at a, an article that was published in the European Journal of Clinical Pharmacology just this year, they, fit, they actually compared the FDA versus the European um, uh, FDA equivalent and also the Swiss, and they found that the number of drugs and the indications between the European and the Swiss were very similar, but there was a hugely statistically significant difference with the FDA. So looking at ways of trying to get more information. Also remove the barriers, and I think some of my colleagues have already said this, remove barriers to biosimilars. Biosimilars hold a huge hope for us in terms of trying to bring uh, our costs down. And then look at um, patent protection for Me Too drugs and market exclusivity. Do we really need another beta blocker? Um, is there a way that we can look at that when the FDA approves it and look at market exclusivity and whether we really do need to have the same rules in place for drugs that have actually are just Me Too? Um, looking also at orphan drugs, um, another recommendation is to start the exclusivity point at the time that that first Medicaid, the first orphan drug is approved and the first indication comes. Don't start the clock after the second or the third um, indication comes up. Looking at all those. And then increasing price transparency. Our patients really do need to know about prices. When they come to the pharmacy counter and they see me or one of my pharmacists, they have no idea what they're going to pay until they show up there. And they get blown by the prices that we're charging them and they have no idea that what their co-pays are, what their requirements. And then when we talk to the providers, they don't know either because it is such a black hole. We've got to really increase transparency to consumers. And I'm not going to get started on the manufacturer coupons because that's another one that's a real issue because it's really just giving money back to patients that they're, they're essentially paying anyway up front. So um, I think one of the speakers earlier had said the same thing. So looking at ways of abolishing some of those coupons and the processes that are out there. And I think some of the states have done that.
So that's just it from a from, from pharmacist's perspective. Thank you, Amy. And batting cleanup, um, Rena Conti, who's an associate professor for health policy and economics in the Department of Pediatrics and Department of Public Health Studies at University of Chicago. Her research focuses on financing, organization, and regulation of medical care, and she's an expert on supply and demand and pricing of prescription drugs. Um, she also serves on the National Academy of Medicine uh, Committee on Ensuring Patient Access to Affordable Drug Therapies, which released their consensus report last fall. So, Rena. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, and I love the fact that you've, uh, you've uh, gotten this panel together, the ladies, to solve this problem. <laughs> Thank you, Murray. Um, so, um, makes sense, right? <laughs> anyway. Um, so Under the watchful eye of... <laughs> <clears throat> Later. <laughs> So, um, so I believe strongly that the current system is set up um, to reinforce opacity and complexity to, uh, re to allow certain types of um, entities in this system to profit and others not to. What we're really talking about in terms of reform is reorienting this system so that it serves its true masters, which are American patients their families, and the American taxpayer who is footing the bill for, the, for this at the end of the day. Um, the solutions, again, can get very complex very quickly, but frankly, I think we all kind of know what we need to do. I believe that they, they are basically in three buckets. Buckets is the technical term. <laughs> um, so uh, let me. Uh, so the first is we need to increase competition, particularly among sole source and dual source pharmaceuticals. This includes generics, but also some uh, branded products for which there is very limited competition in the market for um, for other reasons. This means that we need to pull competition into the market and requires competition or requires really coordination across regulatory agencies that actually typically don't coordinate. This includes the FDA. It also includes CMS. And finally, the Food and Drug Administration needs to be talking to the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice related to anti-competitive practices. Also, we need to recognize that, it's, that this is both about supply, but also it's about demand. Specifically, um, there are contractual arrangements among um, insurers and also pharmacy benefit managers that essentially reward winner-take-all contracts, even in markets that have competition. Fundamentally, that erodes competition, it ro erodes patients' ability to choose among products that may be best for them. Secondly, we need to break the unholy alliance keeping drug prices high among pharma, hospitals, and their systems, other middlemen, which include, unfortunately, physicians, pharmacies, and pharmacy benefit managers. I believe 340B pr program reform is critical, but reforming the way buy and bill works for specialty drugs also is more generally important. Lastly, and this is actually the most difficult, we need to start fundamentally questioning the argument that research and development costs determine the prices of drugs. Most economists believe the relationship actually goes in the opposite direction. The promise of high prices pulls innovation. On the other end, once the product is available and developed for the market, manufacturers profit maximize. The research and development costs are foregone. The current system that we have rewards innovation targeted in limited disease categories for people with very good insurance and frankly does not really discriminate between drugs that are highly valuable 
and those with very limited value for both patients and society. Meanwhile, many very promising therapeutic areas lay dormant in development among disease states that have high unmet need and among disease states that truly, if we invested in them, would further public health goals and also further wealth production goals as well. Getting out of this trap requires thinking that high prices are only one tool that we have among many to reward the right type of innovation to meet both individual needs and also society's needs. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. Um, all of you touched on a couple of things, but I just wanted to sort of give another go round to the panel. In the debate, um, because we talked about different kinds of information that people don't have, but what, what do you see as missing? And I don't, I don't mean political will, but what kind of information or uh, other abilities do we not have? And you can answer in any order, but, uh, but Lauren, if you're... Yeah, I'll start. Okay. Happy to start. And I think I'll pick up where Amy left off. I think comparative effectiveness research is critically important. And I know Steve hopefully is still here. I think the work that ICER is doing is incredibly important. I think when we were working on the Affordable Care Act, a lot of us had held out hope that PCORI was going to do some of this analysis. Um, I think it's disappointing, to be honest, that they have not. Um, so I think as we think about, you know, what elements of information do we need to help make better decisions and help physicians and help you know, patients, having that effectiveness research is critically important. Um, my good friends at ARP often note that, you know, we have dossier information that's provided in many European nations um, as part of their approval processes. So it's it's really astounding to me, you know, to think about there are obviously lots of, uh, you know, political obstacles here, but having that information that we know the manufacturers are already doing that research and that work, there's no reason why that can't be provided to the FDA um, as part of the review process on our side. So I think having that information be provided to our government but then also translate in a way that's communicatable to physicians and to consumers and patients is critically important. So something that kept coming up when we um, debated the HB 4005, the Drug Transparency Bill in Oregon, was that, you know, the same argument that pharma always makes is, you know, we have to recover costs. We put so much into R&D. And our pushback was you put a lot into lobbying too, and you put a lot into marketing your drugs and getting your you know drugs to market and in pushing on physicians to buy your drugs and that feels like it's a lot heavier than your R and D knowing kind of where your R and D costs go. So in um, so that is a um, a nugget that we would like to uncover in our um, transparency bill, and so we will see what kind of the, the um, DCBS will come up with in terms of rulemaking, but we do think that that is a critical component to just, sh again, shed some light on where their true um, cost for that initial price comes from. Actually, just a quick clarifying point. When, when does your um, bill take effect? So it takes effect immediately, So, um, but I think uh, DCBS is supposed to start rulemaking this summer. Okay, and first submissions and sort of availability. So I before. think it'll be January of next year. Okay. Okay, and I just want to note on the transparency side that 100% agree, and I think California did a lot of work here to kind of you know start that process. And actually, the federal bill that was noted earlier is also bipartisan in the Senate. Um, Senators uh, Baldwin and McCain, um, and then also Congressman Jan Schakowsky on the House side, um, you know, had introduced a bill that was similar to California, which would also get to a lot of this transparency as well. And obviously, in the, this current political environment, it's not moving. But I think to see Oregon, other states really move forward on kind of where California started, where there's now federal legislation really talks about how all these elements pull together and how we can all kind of, you know, piggyback on all this other work and, and keep it going. Thanks. So um, just as a, a brief aside, I, I think um, many people who look at the state transparency bills view them as an important first step, um, but not a, a solution in and of themselves. And I think we all agree on that. But in terms of the what we know and don't know and need to know, I think the transparency bills are going to be really stellar in pointing to the fact that there's absolutely nothing 
that supports the manufacturer's choice of price. <laughs> Uh, other than the things that are not reported, which has to do with um, sort of the competition as they launch into the market, the competition coming after they launch, uh, the amount of time they have until their patent expires, and the prices of the therapeutic in the therapeutic class or the closest therapeutic class, but like all of the things that you would think would drive pricing in other businesses have absolutely nothing to do. And, and the transparency stuff is going to prove it. Um, and, and so I think it's really important from that perspective. And, and the other thing I, w I wish we knew more about, and I think it is knowable in a way, is you know the manufacturers are always talking about how the world as we know it will be coming to an end in short order after these bills are enacted. Um, and that, you know, patients will die and there will be no more innovation and all of the, even from just transparency, God forbid, there was a rate setting bill. Um, but, and, and we know that that's not true, but that actually is a really sort of frightening and compelling argument to legislators. Like, are they going to really step off? Is it a cliff and are they stepping off? And, you know, I think we just need to know more about how in European systems, when they set up these dynamic, you know, when they set up the rate reviews and the price reviews and all of that, like what, what really happened? Did, did manufacturers leave France? Did they leave Canada, you know, and, and, and how, how did that actually play out? Just a little more research in that area to provide assurance to lawmakers. Yeah, given the length of the innovation pipeline, it's hard to imagine transparency today shuts off projects launched 15 years ago. Oh, Mary, you just don't know. <laughs> Now, in California, we just had we just had notified of two price increases. One of them was Valiant, which I'm not surprised, but we just got notified of those two. I think the transparency on how many patients are actually not picking up their meds because of the copay. I mean, we've actually tracked return to stock rates with our actual copay amounts, and we have found that when the copay goes up, the patients don't pick them up. So it would be great to see that as a patient care, um, just like we're tracking med adherence. Let's track non-adherence due to copay. So on that point, Amy, so we can do that, I'll say relatively easily inside Kaiser Permanente. Um, how easy is it for other pharmacies? I think it would be really easy on the chain drug stores. Yeah. I mean, most of your business right now is on the chain drug store side. And there's big three that actually encompass like 60% of the business in the United States. If they would provide their numbers... You just look okay. at your return, return to stock rate and look at the copay amount. So, well, so the script has to be transmitted to the pharmacy, and then somebody has to not show up to. Right, claim. and then what we do is we, re, when we return it to the to stock, you act, there is actually a report you okay. can run that's called an RTS report that actually tells you what was put back on the shelf because somebody didn't pick it up. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so, I'm, I have a different answer to this question. We. Um, there are, we actually don't know that much about where drugs are manufactured. And um, the FDA system, although it, it does it is transparent in terms of the in terms of the manufacturers that hold a license to make the drug, we don't actually know which of the manufacturers are are actually supplying the US market at a given point in time. And what we've found in our own work is that the number of manufacturers who hold the license far outnumber the number of manufacturers that are actually supplying the U.S. market. So if you just count the licenses, it looks like these markets are much more competitive than they are, actually. Um, and um, so it's entirely possible that actually these markets are much more concentrated than they really – than they. Uh, Perceive, than they are perceived to be. And so when we have shortages or we see price spikes, it's very difficult to figure out, okay, well, is there another supplier that we can go to and say, please ramp up su supply? Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's an issue that we need to overcome. Secondly, I, I actually agree with Mark McClellan here that in the generic space, again, um, there are likely willing foreign suppliers of these products who are making them for European countries and who would love to get into the U.S. market, but currently um, don't have the technical know-how, nor is the system really transparent to allow them to enter easily. 
I think if we lowered the barrier to entry or just made it more transparent and easier to enter, we would allow we would have more competition into this market. We just don't know exactly what which markets we would actually see that type of competition if it was available at in, at this current state. So we've got a um, little time left for, for questions from from the audience and as people are hopefully finding their way to a microphone. Um, I, Rena, I just wanted to follow up on the last point from your opening remarks around um, prices pulling innovation versus innovation um, pushing prices, because that sounds at first, I'm not disagreeing with you, but it sounds like one of those things that economists sort of universally believe and then no one else does. Um, <laughs> At least there's a lot of those. Um, so I, I wonder, you know, if you were walking into a legislator's office, what, how would you explain that to them? Sure. Um, monopoly pricing is an important tool to pull innovation investment into this market. But so is other things. Quantity guarantees matter. Um, so does lowering regulatory costs for entering. So does um, lowering uh, the, co the actual cost of doing research and development by direct subsidization of research and development by the NIH and by the Department of Justice, or sorry, the Department of Defense in man manufacturing drugs or subsidizing, dr uh, subsidizing the production of these drugs. So we, um, as a cis I think, the public tends to focus on the importance of these prices, and that, again, serves pharma's interest and investor class interest. But the pricing incentives are erected on are the base upon which many other incentives are already exist and could actually be much more uh, uh, used if we wanted them to be. Okay. Thank you. I'm not seeing anyone at the microphone, so I will go to my my bag of questions. So, um, and, and Lauren, I, you introduced the point about you know political representatives wanting one issue and one solution, and you know we're we're in this sort of multi-dimensional, multi-faceted world of well, we kind of have to do all of it. Um, I guess I wanted to get both before you answer. I wanted to get from Andrea and from Jane. Um, I don't expect it to be different, but you know, how about at the state level? Is it better, worse? Well, I think that resonated when uh, Lauren mentioned that. I think we saw that um, kind of as a collective body in the Oregon legislature. Yes, it was a lot to get legislators' heads around a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted type of piece of legislation. I mean, I don't even think we could get them around um, some kind of um, you know, OECD a comparison. So we needed to start with transparency, and that was the first solution. So what is the information we're dealing with? Is it, you know, is it legitimate? You know, does pharma really have a case about their, you know, recouping R&D costs? Um, what else is there? So that was our first solution. But saying this is, beware, this is multidimensional, that, you know, the work is not done. We have, you know, this will not cause prices to plummet. Consumers aren't going to see, you know, a big change in their prices, if any. Um, it could stifle a little bit um, price increases, but we don't necessarily think that, you know, we're going to see anything change overnight. So rather than um, frame it as, you know, this is a one step, one solution, this is a very big problem and we're just going to take the first step right now. Thanks. Jane, did you want to weigh in? Um, yeah, these are really complicated issues for state legislators who are in session. Most of the states are only in session like through March, January through March. Uh, a couple states only have four-week sessions. And so to really delve into the complexity of all of this and the solution up against all the pharma pushback and lobbying, it, it's really hard. 
Just one point on that. I think it's important to note, though, also as we're thinking about these issues, that we all, I think, acknowledge this is a long-term conversation that we're not going to effectuate change overnight. And so I think that as state legislators are, are dealing with these issues and so are federal policymakers, we can't let perfect be the enemy of good. So having one bill being a transparency be the first step, that's a very important. That's a victory. And now we're on to the next step. So I think, you know, it's, I equate it to, you know, toilet training my children. You know, you did a great job. You get your chocolate kiss. And now let's move on to the next issue. So, and, and, uh, uh, I, I think I'm going to let that one go, but okay. <laughs> so, and I, I also Amy? wanted to say that, like, oh. last year we saw that there were about 130 uh, pieces of legislation introduced in state legislatures. And then this year, um, and that was over the course of, like, nine months. Uh, and this year, by March, we have 140. And, uh, and the thing that we see most happening right now in terms of, you know, picking away at the issue is uh, a lot of the PBM transparency legislation is the thing that can move, seems to be moving the most in the states right now. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is everybody hates the PBMs. Farm has done a very effective job of pointing fingers. Uh, and and it, it is a very opaque uh, business model that they have. But also they, they can't sue like pharma can sue. You know, they don't have patent law behind them. And uh, the Dormant Commerce Clause stuff doesn't really apply. So that, that's the stuff we're really seeing moving this year with a couple standouts in importation and rate setting. Yeah, and they're not regulated either, which is another Well, that's another area. thing that states are doing this year is regulating them, licensing them. I just wanted to echo Lauren's point. I, I don't, there's problems with our pharmaceutical supply chain. It's not even just about pricing, even about supply, just some of the drug shortages. And it's actually the same, same issues as with drug pricing. You can't. It's just the economics and how uh, medications are accessed to patients. Because I would gather, I would also say that the drug shortages are causing just as many issues as the drug prices for patient access. Okay. And I'll just come back to, I think it starts where, where this all begins is with the manufacturer. And the problem begins with how they set their price and everything flows from that. So as we're thinking about all of these issues, which are all valid, we need to come back to where it all begins, which is how they determine what the list price is going to be for a product. Steve, I'm going to give you the honor okay. of closing out the uh, question for oh, Q&A no, for this closing panel. question. Well, first, I have to say that toddler uh, toilet training uh, metaphors, <laughs> I think, are perfectly appropriate for drug pricing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say something about the transparency. Transparency feels like it has arrived, and other states will be implementing it. There's still a lot to learn about it. But as you said, we're, we're going to be thinking, what's the next step? What's Transparency Plus or Transparency 2.0? Um, I just want, quickly, if you might want to comment, because I can see this going down two different branches. One is to try to take the disclosed information on price increases and have some mechanism for judging whether the disclosed information makes sense. I mean, okay, they raised it 15%. Maybe they had evidence, recent evidence, that the drug was 15% better than it used to be. Probably not, but you know, there's always some process for a back-end judgment. Um, another way to take it, though, would be to say right now a lot of these state laws are focusing pretty much just on either generic price increases or price increases of brand drugs and are not trying to go at launch prices. And so I just came from a large purchaser uh, meeting today where they were talking to their PBM. They actually feel like they've solved the price increase problem. They've told their PBM, we're not going to do the same rebate structure with you anymore, so you don't have an incentive to just let these price increases go and you'll take more at the list price. Um, and, you know, states are going to have an impact through public shaming. But the purchasers today are really now pivoting to focus on launch prices. And so my question for you, I guess, is do you see what you think the low-hanging fruit with the next stage of transparency? What does it look like? Does it look like moving to launch prices? and trying to get a handle of that, or is it look still something around price increases in, in some way? Ten seconds on by answers. Uh, I'll start. So I think you're absolutely right, and um, that uh, the more rate regulation there is on the increase, the more manufacturers, both in the generic and the branded space, will put those prices into the launch price. Um, and then we will have an issue about the launch price, both of existing drugs and of and of old of new drugs too. Um, the um, the system generally can handle uh, la high launch prices um, on, in areas where there is significant therapeutic competition, but 
in areas where there is not, pretty much we've sig already s signaled that we're willing to pay pretty much anything uh, in certain therapeutic classes. So that is the next hurdle. My view is that, again, quantity guarantees, other types of um, other types of purchasing arrangements are going to have to be considered here um, in order to kind of make it more palatable to, um, to have some sort of rate regulation or something on the launch prices that we're going to pay in the breakthrough categories. Thank you. I'm going to give you the last word, Rena, because we're past time, and I want to give Tony Barretta a chance to close us out. You, you guys just, we'll just stay here. Oh. Tony, you okay. just come on up. Okay.